You're, you're muted, Gordon. Okay, thank you. So thank you for the introduction. I just noticed my title is slightly different, but it actually means the same thing. So how can we uh, analyze glycans and learn something about protein glycosylation, which we can use both as a biomarker, but equally important to understand what do these glycans do as an effectors of both aging and diseases related to aging. And as you all know, but it's good to remind you, glycans are the ultimate layer of molecular complexity. But in the same time, they're the most neglected molecules of cellular communication. And one of the prominent examples was in this pandemic when the director of NIH was tweeting about the S glycoprotein, which looks like this, without even a single glycan. And glycans are not only covering the surface of a protein, they're actually participating actively in the interaction between the spike glycoprotein and its receptors. And actually only, I think yesterday, there was a paper, I think in PLOS Pathogens, saying that without proper glycosylation, it's not possible to have a proper infection with a SARS-CoV-2 virus. Something which is um, odd or peculiar with glycans is they do not have a genetic template. So while every protein is directly involved, uh, encoded in a DNA, so just by reading the gene, we can know the structure of a protein. Glycans are encoded in a complex network of numerous genes, which are interacting both among themselves and with the environment to make a decision what will be the final structure of a glycan that will be attached to a specific site on a specific protein. And these glycans are important structural components of these proteins. So when you think about FC of IgG, or I forgot which protein this is, but Without this glycan part and the color, everything which is colored are the glycans, the protein will be very different and the, its function will be very different. And here I like to make an analogy between the non glycosylated protein and a glycosylated protein, that they're very similar to these two lovebirds, just this one doesn't have a single feather, while this is a normal, fully functional bird. And people studying proteins without their glycans are actually doing something very similar to studying this poor bird without its feathers. So they can do a lot of research on these proteins. They can study the physiology of this bird. They can even study this bird walking, or they can even study the eyesight of this bird. But this bird cannot fly. So if you're studying a bird like this, you will never see a bird flying. You will not be able to understand that bird can fly. The same thing happens with the proteins. So studying only the protein part of a glycoprotein, we can never see the whole picture. We can never fully understand what this protein actually does. And one important thing about the glycans is they're not fixed, they're dynamic. Contrary to the polypeptide part, which is the same from the moment we are born until we die, glycans are changing. For example, on IgG, when we are younger, we have more glycans of this type. As we are getting older, our IgG glycans are getting shorter and they act more pro-inflammatory. So another analogy for people not familiar with glycans, we can think about the protein as a combination of polypeptide this could be a human body and a glycan. This could be a coating which we can put on our body depending on the condition. And if it's snowing, like it's now snowing in most of Europe, this would be a good modification. But if we come, for example, to Croatia in summer, this would be way better modification of our body. And occasionally we make a mistake. We put the wrong glycan 
on the wrong position in the wrong moment. Like these guys here, they're definitely not fit for the environment and they would not survive long in winter. And when we think about the cell surface, and this is the cell surface under microscope, there are cells, but on the end of the surface of the cells, there is a huge layer of glycocalyx. So actually these glycans are either functional fortification like this, or if there, if there is something wrong with the glycans, then this fortification is not working and we don't have these protective walls. Another very important aspect of glycans is their very large inter-individual differences in glycosylation between people. And glycans are responsible for a large part of phenotypic variation between people. Actually, the first biomarker in personalized medicine were glycans. So the first biomarker which was introduced in personalized medicine is actually the blood group testing. So testing for the A, B, A, B, or O blood groups is a testing for different glycans, which give people different functional properties. And importantly, so the first example of uh, biomarkers for personalized medicine were glycans. Unfortunately, not many of them followed later. But there are many strategic documents saying glycans are important. And in this pandemic, this became even more visible when glycans got even the centerfold of the New York Times with the SARS-CoV-2 with all the glycosylated structures on its surface. The reason many people still ignore glycans is because they're very difficult to analyze. They're structurally complex, numerous chemical steps are needed to come from a glycan or from a glycoprotein to, to the final data set. And while many people in this group now think this is simple because we do it all the time, actually this is very complicated and only a decade ago, this was really challenging. And for the majority of the world, this is still challenging. So people simply don't do it. We are doing this high throughput glycomics for over a decade. We analyzed over 150,000 different glycons, but not from any people, but from some of the best phenotyped and genotyped cohorts in the world, including the Twins UK database, where we now have over 20,000 glycoms, uh, ORCAs, Dalmatians, EPIC, and so on. And we do it in collaboration with the many leading research institutions, which are enabling us to combine the glycomics with all the other data they have, starting from the genetic data, but also epigenetic, metabolomic, and so on. So practically, we finished this first big fishing expedition. We collected a huge load of fish. And what this uh, consortium was, was doing for the large part during the last three and a bit more years was actually working on these spreadsheets which we and, in, and also Manfred and Parks Erdman generated in the past few years. And thanks to this huge amount of data, which is now available and linking this data with the high quality clinical and other type of information, it became possible to publish glycomic papers in the leading journals, and we have a good example from another consortium we have, which was an IBD consortium, where we had two gastroenterology papers, one led by the Manfred's team, one led by my team, and also journals like Circulation, Nature Chemical Biology, Diabetes Care, and so on. These are papers which are now accessible to the glycomic research. And actually nowadays, even adding glycans to a clinical study is helping it to come to a better journal. And I hope in a couple of years, it won't be possible to publish a good clinical paper without at least some glycan data. And what we are now trying to do, we are trying to merge these different data sets and see what we can learn. And first thing, of course, is linking 
genetic data because this is simple. And something we learned here is that glycoprotein is a biological structure, it's a chemical structure, but genetically, it is a complex trait. So there are multiple genes and their variants which interact to define a final structure which would be added to a specific glycoprotein. This is quite unique and this is very important because this is giving a huge evolutionary advantage to multicellular organisms because we can generate novel chemical structures by just rearranging allelic variants of a large number of genes. And this is something we have demonstrated on a collaborative cross cohort of mice, which was generated by Grant Morahan at the University of Western Australia, where he started from, uh, I believe, eight founder strains, crossed them for three generations, created cousins, which were then inbred into strains. So he practically generated hundreds of strains of cousins or kind of nearly clones of cousins, which we then analyzed the glycan data there. And something which I find fascinating is that by only three generations of reshuffling allelic variants, these strains of mice became so different in the way they glycosylate, in this case, these were immunoglobulins, that you can actually stratify individuals from different strains on a PCA analysis. So by reshuffling genes, these mice generated a biological and chemical diversity, which made them different. So it's a kind of a micro evolution going on on a very rapid scale, thanks to protein glycosylation. And something which I think we have to make people aware of is that when we talk about alternative glycosylation, so having a different glycan structure on a given glycosylation site, uh, majority of scientific community would still think that this is maybe irrelevant. But actually alternative glycosylation is in a functional way analogous to coding mutations. So you have a change in protein structure, but not encoded in a single gene, not inherited in a Mendelian way, but inherited as a complex trait by reshuffling of uh, allelic variants, which then creates alternative glycosylation which then creates proteins which have uh, different functional characteristics. And to make things even more complicated, it is not only that this is a complex genetics, there is a very strong influence of also epigenetics because all these allelic variants can also be uh, affected by epigenetic regulation. So by different activation of specific genes, we can also change protein glycosylation. And to some extent, also the environment, the metabolome can also directly affect protein glycosylation. So final glycan is the result of a genetic background, epigenetic information, environmental factors, which then integrate into glycosylation of a protein. And for many proteins, this is functionally very important. Not so many proteins have been studied in sufficient details that we know what happens if you have alternative glycosylation. But one of the examples where this was clearly established is immunoglobulin G. So for IgG, we know that, for example, if you have this core fucose, this core fucose is a safety switch, which is preventing activation of FC gamma receptor 3A, and it's diminishing the ADCC activity, antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. Also, extension of this structure from n glucosamine by galactose and sialic acid at the end is reducing the pro-inflammatory potential of IgG because these structures would activate complement and kill the target, while sialylated structures on the FC domain 
would mostly act as an immunosuppressive molecule. So we are practically changing the function of IgG from a killer molecule, which is activating ADCC or activating complement, into immunosuppressive molecule, which is suppressing low-grade chronic inflammation if it's galactosylated and salivated. And there is a lot of research in this field driven by the pharma industry because monoclonal antibodies are now the best-selling drugs and they're creating billions of dollars of income every year. So they're really trying hard to understand how to make a better drug by changing the antibody glycosylation. But there's also an aspect of a patient because people are different. And if people are adapted to a specific type of glycosylation, then maybe different drugs would have a differently glycosylated drugs would have a different functional effect. And what we have shown quite some time ago now is that if you look at different people, and this is just random six individuals, different glycan structure presented in a different color, you see that their glycom composition, IgG glycom composition is quite different. So people are different and big part of it is genetic. So approximately 50% of a glycom composition is explained by heritability. So for example, if your parents have very high agar lactosylated structure, most probably you will be somewhere in this region. While the other 50% is determined by something else and not by the genes. So the glycon composition and the functional IgG glycon composition and its functional uh, consequences, meaning will it be more pro-inflammatory or less pro-inflammatory, more activating ADCC or less, is partly determined by genes, but partly by the environment. And one of the key environmental factors is age. So when we were studying population cohorts, and these are four different populations, Cortial Island, Orkney Islands, Twins UK, and the Vs cohort, and some of these cohorts you were working on in this consortium, First thing which we noticed that these glycans change a lot with age. Blue are males, red are females. And the pattern of changes is highly reproducible between the different cohorts. So it's a kind of a universal pattern of changes with the agalactosylated structures going up, galactosylated structures going down, partly linear with some strange bumps in females around the menopause age. And when we try to put just IgG glycans in, in a simple predictive model, we could predict chronological age of a person plus minus nine years. At, when we did it first time, and it was nearly 10 years ago, this was interesting because there were no good markers for chron chronological age. Now, of course, methylation is a way better marker because it's more predictive for chronological age. But actually, problem with at least the Horvath, original Horvath clock is that this is too accurate for chronological age. So it is not very informative. While glycans actually vary quite a lot around the chronological age. And what is explaining this difference, so the difference between the glycan age and, and the chronological age, are the parameters, or at least it correlates with the parameters of biomarkers of unhealthy life. So people who live unhealthy lifestyle seem to be changing their glycans toward the old glycom faster than people who live a healthy lifestyle. Also, if people get ill with the different diseases, and here we have a number of different uh, complex diseases, the last four bars are the age, so effects of aging in a four different cohorts. And the other colors are the effects of different diseases like lupus, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, arthritis, uh, type two diabetes, even cancer. We see that people with the disease mostly change in a similar way as aging. So younger people with the disease look like older healthy people. And in some cases, 
this change also happens before disease actually develops. So it's not only the consequence of a blown disease, but it's kind of a, either a pre-existing risk factor or, or a very early uh, functional change, which then contributes to disease development. And uh, I didn't put it on this slide yet, but we see something similar in COVID, something we published a few months ago. We see that people who had uh, severe COVID compared to controls have glycans, which have affected, altered N-acetylglucosamine, bisectin, glucnac, and also changes in galactosylation and salylation. And here, contrary to the, the paper which uh, Manfred and his team published, we looked at the total IgG glycan. So this is all IgG, not only anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. We also looked all around the world to see whether IgG glycans are different in the different populations. So we collected 27 different populations, 100 people from each of the populations. We tried to get as wide as possible age span. We had this study as a fully randomized across 32 well plays. We, this time we looked at the glycopeptide level. And we were actually quite astonished to see how strongly the IgG glycan correlates with the expected lifespan and the human development index. So people living in the more developed countries with the expected higher lifespan were changing the glycan toward the old glycan much slower than people living in a poor countries with a shorter expected lifespan where IgG glycan very quickly moved toward the old, so-called old IgG glycan. And so when we look at all these countries, they're different and big part of the differences is explained by the by the location we haven't we do have a little bit of data of people of different ethnicity moving to the developed countries there is a cyber stu saber study with the uh, people of indian origin and people of um, of uh, uh, i think it was uh, somewhere in the caribbean Trinidad and Tobago, I think, who moved to, to uh, or Jamaica, no, it was Jamaica, who moved to UK. And there you could also see some differences because of the uh, genetic difference, but they were more similar to the UK counterparts than the differences between this country individual. So this is an interesting aspect. So how in different parts of the world, IgG glycom is changing different due to both genetics and the environmental factors. And it is complicated. So we are trying to understand how it's all dysregulated and through a series of GWAS paper. And this is something what Azra is now doing the, the, the last generation of this analysis. We are identifying genes which regulate IgG glycosylation. And I think together with Azra's data, we are now on a 40 plus different genes which work together to regulate IgG glycosylation. We do not know exactly how this happens. We know that some of these genes regulate the expression, expression of uh, glycosyl transferases. So the enzymes which add final sugar, but it's some of these things are more complicated. And I must admit, we don't fully understand how this could be happening because some of these genes doesn't even seem to be the, the B cell genes. So maybe part of the final glycan composition is not determined by the signaling within the cell. Maybe it's uh, determined by the clonal selection, by the interactions between different cells, but it's definitely a very complicated process. And this process also affects our predisposition for many different diseases. So genes which are regulating IgG glycosylation are known risk factors for diseases like IBD, asthma, RA, Crohn's disease, Parkinson, and so on. And actually, when Lucia did a large pleiotropy map a couple of years ago, she identified 94 different phenotypes, which are uh, where the same genes are the risk factors for the phenotype, and the same genes are regulating IgG glycosylation. Some of them were uh, 
kind of expected, like uh, lupus or uh, type 1 diabetes or Crohn's disease. But some of them were quite unexpected, like Parkinson disease, dementia, and so on. So there is a lot of um, pleiotropy, which we still have to work a lot to understand what does it actually mean. Uh, a couple of days ago, a huge review prepared by Maria and Marina was published in this comprehensive glycoscience second edition. It's, I think, 513 references. So if you are interested to read it, I'll be happy to share the copy. It's, it's not open access, so and it's behind the paywall. So if you need it, just send me, email me, and I will send you a copy of the paper. So there are many diseases where IgG glycosylation is affected. I'll just go through some of the examples where we did more comprehensive analysis. One was uh, hypertension, where we noticed that both people with hypertension, but also pre-hypertension, show altered IgG uh, glycon composition. And in the same time, there was a series of papers by Phil Scholl at the UT Southwestern suggesting that IgG glycosylation might actually be causative of hypertension in obesity. So both obese mice and humans, he claims that it's a hypocellulite IgG binding to FC gamma receptor 2B playing role in hypertension. And then we teamed up with him and did a large study of people, and he also did mice, where he actually fed mice with N-acetylmanosamine. N-acetylmanosamine is precursor for uh, salic acid, and by feeding MANAC, he was able to increase salylation of IgG in these mice. So if mice were put on a high-fat diet, they had decreased salylation, but if they were supplemented with MANAC, then the IgG cellulation was increased. Unfortunately, this was quantified only by the lectin blotting and the samples were no longer available when we joined. So we have only lectin blotting data for this IgG glycosylation. But what he also showed is that when he had mice on a fat diet, high fat diet, they became obese. Also when supplemented with the MANAC, they became obese. This is a control mouse, but while high fat mice, uh, the, the obese mice developed the hypertension, the addition of MANAC prevented developing hypertension in mice. So this suggests that indeed, hypocellulated IgG or not properly glycosylated IgG could have a role in the development of hypertension. We did a huge cohort of people and we did show that there is association between hypocellulation and a high blood pressure. Based on that data, we looked in a population cohorts. This is something we did with Tim and Jim a couple of years ago, and where we published that IgG glycon composition associate with the cardiovascular disease risk score. So the IgG glycon today predicts the risk of cardiovascular disease. But at this level, this was just association in a cross-sectional study. So we went to the EPIC cohort. EPIC was collected nearly 30 years ago. We got access to the POTSUM cohort of 27,000 people. And out of these 27,000 people, there was uh, 400 people who had either heart attack or stroke in the follow-up period. So we looked at the glycosylation in the people who developed CVD event in the future and the control group and showed that IgG glycom is indeed predictive of future CVD events. And in men, it's comparably predictive to uh, AHA score. And in women, it's even more predictive and actually even a single glycan, this structure here, plus age is more predictive than the AHA score. And when you combine it, you get even a bit more prediction. So there is some information about the future cardiovascular events in the IgG glycol. And what we are trying now also is to develop a commercial branch of what we do. So to translate the knowledge about IgG glycol into a test we call the glycan H test. 
which is a kind of a quantified information that is integrating genetic, epigenetic, and environmental factors into a single index, which is more or less measuring low-grade chronic inflammation, as we know at the moment, and effects of all the lifestyle factors, everything we do in our life, and how they change IgG glycom, and how is this then affecting inflammation, and we call it biological age, and we call it the biological age, because this is the way we got approval from European Medicinal Agency to sell it as a test. We didn't try to register it as a test for chronic inflammation because that's, this would have to be a diagnostic test. And the, the market we are kind of targeting is more or less everybody because we all want to live healthier. And the question is, can we change and will the change in our glycans help us live a healthier life? And there is one paradox, and the paradox is that we all know that if we live a healthy life, we will live longer, longer and we will not become ill. And there is very strong evidence that a healthy lifestyle can improve a healthy lifespan for 10 years. So we can get 10 years of healthy life if we have a number of healthy habits in our lives, but people don't do it. And people don't do it because it is difficult and, and the reward comes very late. So making a hard decisions in your thirties and being rewarded in your sixties or seventies is something we simply don't do. And we have this very well-known example of these two monkeys. This guy is on a normal diet while this guy here is on a caloric restriction for the last 20 years. And he does look healthier, but he's definitely not happy. So I don't think that anybody of us want to be hungry for 20 years to have a bit longer lifespan. So there has to be a simpler solution than just being hungry. And this is why people are developing biomarkers of biological age so that we can quantify whether something what we are doing is actually helping. And most of these biomarkers are now epigenetic, with some of them being a little bit more complicated, like a pheno age or the dunedin poam age. And they're all good in number of aspects, but one aspect they're missing is that they're not responding to interventions. So the field of biomarkers of aging is uh, desperately needing biomarkers which would respond to interventions which are known to be beneficial. And the glycan age seems to be working quite fine here that you can actually do something and then change your glycan age. There are not so many people who have been tracked for the long time. One of them is me. This is my glycan age and the G0, G2, and S. And as you can see, I'm nearly outside of the scale. I'm horrible. I'm close to 80 now. And more or less, I was moving in the same direction all time. And this is for the last, I think, six or seven years. Beside here and here, and what happened here, I, I went on a diet. And in the meantime, I was trying to exercise more. I was trying to sleep more. Nothing worked for me. For me, only being hungry works, so I'm this poor guy who has to be on caloric restriction to live longer, and I still haven't decided to do that. And this, this peak here, that's COVID. So this is when I got COVID, I got older five years in actually a couple of weeks. But I'm, I'm getting back now. So when I recovered from COVID, I'm improving. So I'm not 80 anymore, I'm 78. Wow, great me. But some people are maybe luckier than I, because there are key, four key factors, sleep, stress, physical activity, and diet. I'm this poor guy who has to be hungry, but somebody else maybe needs a little bit more sleep or has to think about stress or a little bit more physical activity to improve their IgG glycome. And there are some magic solutions. So um, there are, there's an anti-aging community and people do many different things. For example, Joseph Raffaella has a clinic in New York and 
every of his male clients are 20 to 30 years younger. This guy is 76 and he's still dancing every night. So, you know, people can stay younger or this, uh, this is a kind of a biohacker also has a million followers. He's doing also many crazy things, but he's also 20 plus years younger and his, his followers are younger. So there are some ways to do it. Although I must admit personally, taking all the range of supplements Joseph is giving to his clients is not something I would like to do. So what we are trying to do now, we are trying to dissect everything what he does to see what actually works. And something which does seem to work in women is estrogen. We got access to a very interesting uh, study, which was done uh, in US a little bit more than 10 years ago. They had 36 women who accepted to have a chemical induced menopause. They were injected with a drug to suppress all the gonadal hormones. And after this intervention in the month, their IgG glycome changed drastically. So based on glycan age, I think on average was nine years older in a month in a placebo group. But a group of women had an estrogen supplementation. So the estrogen group did not change IgG glycome at all. So if you suppress the gonadal hormones, your IgG glycome moves to the old glycome very quickly. But if you just give estrogen as a supplement, yes, as an estrogen patch, this does not happen. Also, after the end of the intervention, following the recovery, both the, also the, the placebo group returned more or less back to normal. So estrogen is something which clearly works for women. We don't know whether it works for men, but it would be a little bit more complicated. Another thing which clearly works is the bariatric surgery, which is again, a very drastic approach. So bariatric surgery is a surgery on your stomach when you shrink your stomach so you can't eat. So people lose a lot of weight and their IgG glycome improves after that surgery. But interestingly, normal weight loss is also something which works in the majority of people. So we were following 2000 twins over 20 years with the three different time points. And the green line here were twins who were uh, gaining weight and the red were twins who were losing weight and the blue were twins who did not change in weight. And what we see here is that twins who were gaining weight were actually moving toward old glycon faster than twins who were losing weight or were not changing their weight. So just by losing some extra kilos, IgG glycon can improve, but there is no magic diet. We also analyzed the glycans from the Diogenes study and they had thousand people on uh, four different, uh, five different diets. So after the initial weight loss period where they all improved a bit, but this was a very short time period, they have uh, six months of a different diets. And what we see here, more or less on each diet, some people improve, some people did not improve. So there's no magic diet, but Losing weight helps. How we can lose weight and improve is something we still don't know. The same thing for physical activity. There are some types of physical activity which help some people, other types which help other people. There is no magic solution. And something what I wanted to remind you here is that we are looking at IgG glycom, which are the functional effectors, and they have multiple roles in balancing inflammation. So whatever we do with IgG glycosylation, it affects inflammation in multiple ways. And the big picture behind all that is that normally people go to hospital when they're ill, when some of the organs stop functioning. 
And usually this is irreversible. You were labeled as a kind of, uh, you get the diagnosis of a chronic disease and you stay ill until you die. But if we find the disease here, where only biomarkers have started to change, if only IgG glycosylation has started to change, then maybe a lifestyle intervention or a quick preventive pharmacotherapeutic therapy can return people to normal condition and avoid diseases. And this is something we are trying to do with the glycan age to have a clock, a glycan clock, which people can measure, can see how they are, and they don't have to wait for 20 years to see the outcome. They can have objective insight into current state of information. They can quantify it regularly and then get improved uh, IgG glycan based on an improved lifestyle. And in second part of my talk, which will be short, I will just show you another example, and this is glycans in diabetes. There are several lines of evidence suggesting that glycans are not only biomarkers, but the functional factors of development of type 2 diabetes. And we also bumped into that when we did the first GWAS, and then the HNF and alpha popped out as the key regulator of uh, uh, fucosylation of antenary proteins. And this protein, HNF and alpha, if there is a mutation, it's causing a disease called maturity onset diabetes of the young. So gene not functioning, you develop diabetes, and then we developed a glycan test for that, which can be used to diagnose people with this rare disease. But the question is, will epigenetic silencing of the same gene have a similar effects on diabetes as a mutation in that gene? Logically, this should be the case. And when we looked for a correlation, we did find a correlation between the HNF and alpha methylation and the changes in the IgG glycom. And then Vladka and her team developed a specific tool. This is something what Samira is working on to change the HNF and alpha methylation and to see whether this will have an effect on diabetes. And what we have shown so far, this part is unpublished, that indeed in some people there is epigenetic silencing of HNF and alpha, which could be one of the causes of type 2 diabetes. Then again, we looked in the population cohorts. We do see that people with diabetes have a different plasma glycom than people without diabetes. We also looked into the prospective cohorts of people who did not have diabetes at the time of sampling. Still some information there. Based on this data, went again to this EPIC cohort, the same cohort I was describing before, but we just looked not at the CVD, but at people who developed diabetes, 743 of them developed diabetes, compared them at the baseline, so before they had any traces of diabetes, and showed again that just the IgG glycom, uh, sorry, uh, total plasma glycom composition was plus age was more predictive than the entire German diabetes risk score. But diabetes is not a single disease. Diabetes has a multiple pathways, and we think that the silencing, uh, the changes in glycosylation could be relevant to, to uh, a pathway which also associates with the hypertension in acute disease. I don't have time to go into details, but we do think that this could be a subtype of diabetes for which glycosylation is relevant. And to finish this diabetes part, so we have a biomarker, we call it the diabrisk, which is visible several years before any other symptoms. So the glucose is normal, HbA1c is normal, just the glycans are altered. This seems to be relevant for a subgroup of future diabetes patients, where glycans are not only a biomarker, but active effector in disease development. And we currently are trying to set up some trials to see whether if we change the IgG, if we change the plasma glycan composition, will it affect future diabetes risk. And to remind you at the end, if you want to understand biology, you have to include glycans in your studies because otherwise you are just looking at this bird without feathers and you cannot understand that birds can fly. And at the very end, we have multiple grants which are funding everything we do. I am for future is one of them, but many others, which I have to say thank you for funding. And I'm finished here and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Professor.